And I want to talk tonight about the unpredictable path. How many of you know the path when we follow the Spirit can be unpredictable? <laughs> you know, we all, we all want to, you know, try and r factor out as much risk as possible in our life. But if you were here a couple weeks ago and got to hear Heidi Baker speak, it was pretty much risk that she was touting to us as the most important component of her life as a follower of Christ, to be willing to take risks, to step out of boats, to see if you can walk in places you have no business walking, to see power move through your life that you know is not your own. It takes risks, and God's called us to be a people that are risk takers in faith, and that we lean not, what does Proverbs say, on our own understanding, but we lean and we rely upon the Holy Spirit a renewed mind no longer conforms to the predictable patterns of this world, but is free to jump off the cliffs of convention into the womb of invention. I'll read that again. This just popped into my brain last night sitting on the couch. Uh, and this is just what the Lord was showing me. That a renewed mind in Christ no longer conforms to the predictable patterns of this world, this world system but it's free to jump off the cliffs of convention into the womb of invention. That's what Peter did. He jumped off a cliff of convention. Conventional wisdom says, you don't step out of a boat, Peter, because you're not a fish. And if you stand on water, you're going to sink. But Peter boldly and in faith stepped out, and all of a sudden, invention was born. I don't know how God did it, but God invented a way in the moment for Peter to not sink into the water, but to supernaturally walk upon the water. God's called us to supernaturally walk with him, but we will only do it in power if we're willing to risk jumping off the cliff. Who wants to do some cliff jumping in your life? I do. Although some days I don't. <laughs> The older you get, the more daunting cliff jumping gets. The more, uh, the more important it becomes to... I'm sorry, I, I'll try not to eat this thing. I'll leave it away a little bit. You know, the more we kind of want to see that, you know, our, our Roth IRA is, is progressing nicely and everything is in line. And those things are important. This is not a message to say we should not plan and be wise for the future. But you know what? Everything is the Lord's and everything is up for grabs. Everything we have, everything we are. He's not going to steer us wrong. We've got to be willing to be people that can take risks. If you've got your Bibles, I'm going to read from Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Anybody ever been in a season of your life where you feel like, I, I just can't, I don't know what his will for my life is. I don't know what his will is. You know, well, right here we're given a, a little bit of an insight if we're conforming to the patterns of the thinking of men in this world, we're going to have a really hard time discerning what is good and perfect will is. But if we allow our minds, if we, if we say, you know what, I'm not going to conform just to the conventional wisdom of the ideas of the mind of man, but I'm going to allow my mind to be renewed by the spirit and the washing of the word, then we'll find it's going to be a whole lot easier for us to discern and test what his will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I want to define a couple words real quick. I want to define the word conformity. Because I believe we're called to be nonconformists. Although, did you like my wardrobe change there after worship? I just would like to thank my mother-in-law, Karen. This is a J. Crew blazer. I feel pretty good in it. I feel, way, I feel so much more pastoral when I put it on. You know, my worship leader attire is just a T-shirt. But, you know, if we're going to pastor here, Steve, is, was this a good call? Do you respect me more? Do you feel like maybe I'm a little bit more intelligent than I was in just a green T-shirt? Because I feel more intelligent. And I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> But listen, what is conformity? 
this is how it's defined action in accord with prevailing social standards attitudes and practices so conformity is when in an action in, we take action that is in accord with the prevailing social standards attitudes and practices so right off the bat you know that we probably shouldn't be conforming <laughs> to the culture around us right because in so many ways it's become hostile to the knowledge of God and to the Lordship of Jesus Christ what about conventional conventional wisdom and we all want the spirit of wisdom but then we got this conventional wisdom what kind of wisdom is that to the word conventional means adhering to accepted standards or ordinary rather than different or original who's excited to be ordinary who just woke up today and said I just want to be as ordinary as I can today okay so to be conventional means to accept and be ordinary what people ordinarily expect you to be what society ordinarily expects of you to be conventional means to be ordinary rather than being different. We don't want to be different. The fear of man and man pleasing in us makes we don't want to be different. We don't want to stand out. We don't want to we don't want people to think that we're different or that we're weird. We are very weird. We are very different. The Bible even calls us peculiar. Let's just embrace it as an identity. We are circus freaks. We are weirdos. We don't fit in. We are different. It's cause for celebration, not fear. Why would we want to blend into something that's death in people's lives anyway? To be conventional means to be ordinary rather than different or be ordinary rather than original. You are the original you. In society, in culture, in the system of this world, we try to put a type on you We've all got our personality types and our profiles and we're this kind of person and we fit in this kind of job and if we if we get on match.com they'll match us up with just the right person that's our type you know all these labels and these things that we allow our our surroundings and our culture to put on us when we are the original us I am the original me there is no type of me it's just me you know, aren't you just blown away? Just looking at me? <laughs> Man, look at that guy. Gabe. <laughs> you're, not, you're not a type of a person. You're not an indie hipster that loves micro craft brews. You're Gabe. You're the original you. There's no other Gabe. Man, we got to embrace that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We were knit together. God, God doesn't have types of people that he makes. Well, I'm gonna make, I've got four types of people, and I'm going to make so many of this type, so many of this type. I mean, God does not like to be bored. He actually doesn't know what it's like to be bored because he's always creating. Right now, I don't know how many children are developing in wombs right now, but right now God is creating all over the face of the earth. And he's making, he's making like millions of originals right now. And he's so excited about the creativity that's coming out from him as he's weaving someone together that's never been, never will be again. Okay, that's why I don't believe in reincarnation. It's appointed once for a man to die and then face the judgment. God doesn't need to reincarnate. He doesn't need to recycle. Okay, he will recycle your body. This body is the one that I'm going to have for a long time, but it's going to be sown in weakness one day, but raised in power, and it will be glorified. But this is the original me. These fingernails, I don't know what they're going to look like glorified, but they will be my fingernails. You are you for the rest of time. Get to like yourself. Get comfortable with yourself. Be the original you. Don't be conventional and don't conform. So Romans 12, 2 could read this way in light of these definitions. Don't act in accordance with prevailing social standards and attitudes and practices. Don't settle for ordinary, but be different because you're an original. That's what it's saying to us. So just what pattern are we to conform to? What pattern are we called to conform to? 
the pattern of this world, not the natural, or I'm sorry, so what pattern are we called not to conform to? The pattern of this world, and it's not talking, when it talks about the pattern of this world, it's not talking about the natural world. It's not talking about the earth and the oceans and the, and the natural world that God designed that order. But he's talking about the man-devised patterns of thinking and doing. Let's just flip over to 1 Corinthians 20 and just get a little bit of an insight. Or Actually, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll be in verse 20. What is this, this pattern or wisdom of the world that he's talking about here that we shouldn't conform to? I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 1, 20 to 31. Paul says, where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand for miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For, listen to this. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than the strength of man. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. It kind of starts dogging on him a little bit. He's like, listen, you're not the sharpest tools in the shed. Just admit it. He says, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. You weren't important. You weren't wealthy. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before Him. It is because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus. Who has become for us wisdom from God? That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Start to make sense now? The spirit of the world, the wisdom of the world, is man boasting in what he has and does. All you got to do is watch a couple music videos. I got my Maserati with my rims. You know, I got my crib, I got my J. Crew blazer, <laughs> you know. The spirit of the world is the man's boasting of what he has and what he does. And Christ is the opposite spirit. It's humility. It's not pride. And so he's saying, listen, you've got to reject the wisdom of the world. You've got to come out from that, that even your insecurity that would make you want to. It even happens in ministry. You know, I see ministers all the time. They're boasting about what God's doing through their ministry and how they're trying to fill up the void and the insecurity in their life, you know, by doing it in the name of God. But they start boasting about, well, we've gotten this many people saved or we've done this many crusades and this many people came. And, and, you know, and and it could be a subtle thing where the enemy just slips in there and it becomes the boasting of what we have and do, even what we do for Christ. But Paul's saying, no one can boast before him. So let him who does boast, boast in the Lord. And Paul goes on to boast about his weaknesses, about what he doesn't have, about his lack, because the Holy Spirit has filled up what he was lacking. We do not need to hoard and scrounge to fill up what we may lack. The Holy Spirit will be able to provide for us everything that we need for life and godliness, as Peter said. If we are enslaved by man-pleasing or the fear of man, we will lack the courage to walk in the will of God, the foolish, unconventional, and unpredictable will of God. Yes, the glorious will of God. The will of God for your life will often make you look like a fool. It will make you look weak. It will make you feel exposed and vulnerable and insecure. Okay, he has not called you to do the things that you can do through your own strength and ability. Otherwise, he just would check out and say, fine, do what you can do. He's called us to do the things that we could never in a billion years accomplish. That's what's so exciting about partnering with the Holy Spirit. You know, it's like 
I get to step into the ring with Mike Tyson and go blow to blow with him, you know? But it's not me throwing the punches, you know? You can go into the pit of the lions and not be afraid. You can be Samson and tear an army apart with your, but it's not you. It's him. You, we get to do things that we can't do. It's awesome. Some of us are thinking too small. We're thinking about how we're going to do things for God that we're able to do. And it's not bad. I know your heart is good, but God wants to do so much more. He wants to do the extraordinary, the remarkable. He wants to do things that people go, it's unbelievable. But yet, there it is. That's how he wants to move through our life. That's how he moved through our forefathers. How have we seen our forefathers bear the scorn and ridicule of following the foolish way? Let's just go through a list of some of them. Noah. Building a giant ark and filling it with two of every kind of creature. Noah appeared to be a crazy lunatic to the people of his time. We read the story and celebrate him. What a hero, man. I'd have been just like Noah too. I'd have built that ark and put all the animals in it. Me and Noah, we're homies. (laughs) Noah looked like a madman to the people of it. You're building a, it's going to rain? What's rain? You know, there was a there was a whole a fountain of the deep, a whole layer of water that the earth's crust was resting upon that watered the ground. There's no rain. There's a whole uh, layer of vapor. You know, there's a reason why why people lived for centuries. For that, some people lived a thousand years. Okay, when you're not dealing with any harmful UV radiation and you're to, you're in an environment that's totally perfect for the human experience, you'll go on living for a long, long time. So Noah is saying, it's going to rain. The whole earth is going to be covered with a lot of water, and everybody's going to be destroyed. And they probably laughed and laughed and laughed at him. So oftentimes the will of God in your life will totally bring scorn and ridicule and mocking voices to you. Are you ready for it? What about Abraham? He leaves his home behind where he has wealth, he has favor, he has security, He sets out for an unknown land, surrounded by uncertainty and dangers. He clings to a far-fetched promise of an heir, even though he and Sarah are well beyond childbearing years. Abraham seems really stupid to to the modern American. Why would you leave a place where you're established? Your father's house has wealth. You have everything that you need. You can do really good things and never really have to sweat about anything, you know? Why would you want to leave all that and go to some new place? Why did he do it? Because the Lord told him to go. And it says Abraham believed the promise that God gave him. He believed that God would give him an heir and that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars. And it says in Hebrews that it was credited to him as righteousness. Righteousness will flourish in your life when you believe the promises that God gives you, even though they seem crazy. Moses confronts the most powerful kingdom on the face of the earth and demands the release of all their slave labor. (laughs) Listen here. Stop building the pyramids. Stop all construction. You got to let my people go. (laughs) All right? You just got to let them go. (laughs) Thinking that Pharaoh's going to be like, you know, you're right. We don't even need these pyramids and these temples. And, you know, I'd like to do some more physical labor. Get my hands dirty a little bit. Just laying around drinking wine and eating grapes all day. You're right, Moses. You guys head on out in here. Take some gold with you while you go. It's crazy. Let my people go. And he, and he got laughed at. Pharaoh laughed at him. Yeah, you, you bet. Why don't you go on ahead and I'll send him after you. <laughs> what was Moses' terrifying weapon of choice to strike fear into the heart of Pharaoh? What was he going to, what did he wield? You better let my people go or I'm going to throw this wooden stick at you. <laughs> he didn't come with an army. He didn't come with a spear. He didn't come with a sword. He didn't come with a bow and arrow. He came with a wooden staff. You best let my people go. I'm going to release a can of you-know-what with this staff on you if you don't. <laughs> this guy's crazy. What an idiot. I just called Moses an idiot. God, help me. 
No, his weapon of choice was a wooden staff and a God who simply calls himself. Moses, who, who do you come in the name of? Who's your authority? Well, I am that I am sent me. You know, I am that I am. Oh, I haven't heard of him. <laughs> what kind of God is he? You know, he sounds like Popeye. You know, I am that I am. So, so God, when, when, when Moses asks God, hey, who should, who should I tell him sent me? Just tell him I am sent you. I would have, I mean, just, hey, Bill. Tell him Bill sent you. <laughs> tell him Charlie sent you. And he's really ticked off. And he's going to come down there and make a ruckus. It's like, no, no, I am. Like, will I am? No, just I am. Just I am that I am. So Pharaoh, I am that I am sent me down here with his wood staff. You got to let all your slave labor go. And that's what needs to happen. It's ridiculous. The, bio, the stories in the Bible are ridiculous. They're ridiculous stories. That's why we should celebrate it so much. Look what God did with foolishness. Foolish people doing foolish things. Gideon, the original 300. Long before Gerard Butler and those abs that just kill me. It's like, you know that that's photoshopped and airbrushed. That cannot all be real. It's real. You've touched him. Whew. He's a bad dude. That man, whew, it was intense. This is the original 300. Way before the Spartans. This is Gideon. And they defeat the Midianites and the Amalekites, whose army, it says, were as thick as locusts covering the valley. 300 guys against an army. As they were, they were, you couldn't even see the floor of the valley. They were thick as locusts. It says their camels were like the sand on the seashore. It's great, you know, in Sunday school when you have little nice cute illustrations to show the kids. Here's Gideon and 300. They're yelling at this huge army and there's victory. Yay, they won. Hooray. If you're Gideon and those guys, you're thinking, oh, crap. <laughs> this is a bad idea. We should not be here. It was with 300 trumpets, blazing torches, and a great shout that victory came to Gideon over the Midianites and the Amalekites. It wasn't great swordsmanship. It wasn't a highly strategic planned attack. The Lord fought for them and he struck terror into the heart of their enemies because they fully trusted that their God would do what he said he would do. And they, they broke the, the pots and they lifted the torches and they blew 300 trumpets and they shouted for the Lord and for Gideon. And bam, they didn't even have to lift a sword. They just picked up the plunder. The Lord will rout our enemies for us, but he will demand from us complete dependence and obedience to him. Some of us are wrestling with things, and we're wondering why we're not getting the victory. You're wrestling with the wrong weapons. You're trying to use your strength and your cunning and your wisdom, but God just wants your weakness and your, and your obedience. Because only he can win the fights that he's called you to fight. David scorns the conventional armor of the day and slays Goliath with the shepherd boy's weapon. Saul tries to put the armor on him. I mean, if you're going to go out there and get killed, do it right, kid. Okay? <laughs> Don't just go out there with nothing. I mean, at least you'll be able to take a few blows. Maybe you'll just lose an arm or a leg or something. So he puts all this armor on him, and David says, I, No, this doesn't work for me. Just give me my sling. Give me five smooth stones. He breaks the pattern of predictable sacrifice and worship and he settles the ark of the covenant in a temple of sound sheltered by the anointed praise of 4,000 Levites you don't take the ark of the covenant out where the blood sacrifice is that's against the law David what are you doing he takes the presence of God the ark of the covenant he sets it in a little tent a bunch of cow hides and wooden poles and he surrounds it with walls of sound because that's what God had put in his heart to do. He took a risk. You know, according to the law, he should have been struck dead or stoned to death. But he did what God had put in his heart to do. And today we have all these psalms and get to read and worship to all these psalms because of what David established in the tabernacle of David. What about Elijah? Elijah embraces the weakness of utter dependence that his God will answer by fire on Carmel. 
knowing that his life literally depends upon it. That's the sh- they got to make a movie about that. That is the ultimate Western. That is the ultimate showdown. Elijah, all the prophets of Baal, one Elijah representing Yahweh, representing I am. There's two sacrifices. And they're both, uh, uh, the, the prophets of Baal are seeking Baal, that fire would come down, that Baal would consume the sacrifice. These guys are going crazy, man. They're whipping themselves. They're cutting themselves. They're, they're, they are putting on a show. And Baal is silent. And so what's Elijah do to his sacrifice? Let's up the stakes a little bit. Just so nobody says, you know, there was just a little bit of a spark or something. Only you can prevent forest fires. You know, he he says, let's get a bunch of water and throw it on it. Let's dig a trench around it. Fill that up with water. Let's make sure that that this is only going to happen one way. Okay, there is no magician's trick here. And he calls upon his God. And what does God do? When everything's on the line. Okay, if, if God doesn't come and fire, Elijah's getting strung up. That's it. It's the end of the road, bro. Okay, God didn't show up. You're a false prophet. You're dead as a doornail. Everything's on the line. Bam, God answers by fire. He honored the risk and the faith and the boldness of Elijah in the face of certain death, and he answers by fire. He wants to answer by fire in our life, too. But he's calling us to greater dependency, greater willingness to take some risks and to step out of the boat. Jehoshaphat, he sends worshiping singers out in front for the battle against insurmountable odds, an unwinnable fight. Their only weapon was a song. (laughs) You can just picture, you know, them in the football huddle. All right, guys, I got an idea. (laughs) Okay. Can't win this fight any other way, but I think I got an idea that's going to work. You guys are going to go in front of the army. No swords, no spears, no shields. But listen to this. You guys are going to sing a song. (laughs) Isn't this brilliant? This has got to work. This is totally going to work. Trust me. This is going to work. Okay, if it doesn't work... You're all dead anyway, so, so you can't come and get me. You know, so, so Jehoshaphat, he sends out the singers in just a song. This, this is the weapon that God has given to us. What do they declare to their enemy as they're singing? It says, they were giving thanks to the Lord. They were singing, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. When you're standing in the face of an insurmountable odd or enemy in your life, You do not feel like saying, give thanks to the Lord. His love endures forever. Can't you tell? (laughs) Can't you tell by this battle that I'm in that I can't win? No, you don't feel like his love endures forever. You feel alone and isolated and abandoned and forgotten, but you're not. And God's looking for someone to stand up and declare that even in the face of terror, the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. Job went as far to say, though you slay me, though you slay me, God, I'll trust in you. I'll trust in your unfailing love. God wants us to get to that place. Lord, though you slay me, though you take my ministry, though you take my job away, though something horrible happens to me, I trust you because the reality is that you're good and your mercy endures forever and no circumstance will ever shake that. We begin to stand and walk like that. The God of power will show up in our life and v- in incredible and awesome ways. I believe it. But if there is ever a big battle that we've got to fight, um, I can't promise you that I'll be the lead singer out in front. That's why I'm training some of you. I want you to get the glory. You to witness the power. It's not about me. What about Mary? Her seemingly scandalous pregnancy. The foolishness of God shaming the wisdom of the world as Messiah is born to a throng of praise from a few shepherds and distant pilgrims foolish enough to wish upon a star. If you wish upon a star. That's what they did. They heard of a prophecy. And they saw the star and they they set out and they came to usher in the entrance of the newborn king to this world with gifts. But I mean, you think, God, couldn't you have done this some better way? 
a way that doesn't cause Mary to be covered in shame and scandal. He's just sneaky Pete like that. He just likes to do things. He loves for us to get defaced a little bit. And it's not because he's like a kid with a magnifying glass on an anthill. You know, he's not sadistic, I promise. But he knows that your death leads to your life. He knows that your crushing leads to your rising. He knows that he has to crush you in order for you to rise. He has to slay you in order for you to be resurrected. And we just have to trust him. If you lay me low, Lord, I trust that you can bring me back up again. Jesus embracing the torture of his body and soul while teaching humanity that true obedience is not to bring a sacrifice, <laughs> but to bring a fruit bar. It's good, Ezra. Jesus teaches humanity true obedience isn't to bring a sacrifice, but to become yourself a living sacrifice. That's what Jesus showed us on the cross. It's not about bringing a sacrifice anymore. God doesn't want you to bring something to give him like he needs anything that you have. He wants you to bring you and throw yourself up on the altar as a living sacrifice. That's what's pleasing to him. Jesus turning our worldview upside down. Where now the last are first, the weak are strong, the poor are rich, the proud opposed, and the humble graced. The stairway down is now the ladder up. Jesus came, turned it all upside, turned the wisdom of the world upside down for us. I'm going to close with this. The Lord himself in character and nature is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Lord is good as mercy endures forever. He was that way a billion years ago. He's that way now. He'll be that way a billion years from now. Yesterday, today, and forever, the Lord is good. His nature and his character do not change. And yet, his ways are so unpredictable. Demanding that we become nonconformists in respect to worldly wisdom. Calling us into a transformational cocoon of trust and obedience. He will, his will for our lives will remain a shrouded mystery as long as we cling to our conventional keys of control and predictability. But Christ, the living word, will be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our narrow and winding path of salvation if we will put all of our hope and our trust in him. Amen? So I've got a closing question. And um, Manny, could you come? Maybe just get on the guitar. But a closing question. Are you willing to jump off the cliff of conventional thinking and predictable living? To walk hand in hand with the Holy Spirit through fiery furnaces, lion's dens, leper colonies, and unwinnable battles? Are you willing to have your conventional crutches exposed by Holy Spirit and embrace the foolishness of the gospel way? Do you want to be a fool? You willing? You willing to give up the crutches of control? The areas where we just don't feel like it's quite safe to give him lordship of that because he might screw it up or take it away from us. Let's just take a risk. This is just about an attitude of heart thing tonight. It starts with an attitude of the heart. And then God begins to... That's a bad idea. But as our heart changes then all of a sudden, you know, stepping out and talking to that neighbor or that person at work or that person in your class, just stepping out, taking a risk, opening your mouth, beginning to share your testimony of who Christ has been in your life. You could look like a fool. They could say you're an idiot. No thanks. Oh, you're one of those religious bigots. No thanks. Or they could totally have an encounter with God and be changed and be healed.